so bismillahir rahmanir rahim so we uh, yesterday finished at you know calculating the uh, recombination frequency or a combination percentage and what we learned that when we analyze two different traits uh, which reside on the same chromosome so do, two different traits when they inherit through uh, meiosis they show different uh, frequency in the progeny for example we will see uh, black and vestigial as the most predominant uh, the parental uh, phenotypes and the non parentals uh, are significantly significantly lesser or lower than the parentals um, <clears throat> and this these numbers they do not uh, explain mendelian law of independent assortment where we analyze two different traits uh, and we find you know 25% each or 1/4 each Uh, in a population equal probability so uh, parentals and non parentals they are uh, equally represented in the progeny and while studying this problem morgan's lab uh, they discovered that you know mendelian law of independent assortment uh, it holds true when two different traits are on two independent chromosomes but when the two traits are on the same chromosome then this is no more true uh, and you know we get new combinations which were called recombinants and they explain that you know during meiosis when recombination takes place for example here i try to recap what we learned uh, last time so if we have you know homologs on which let's say we have black and we have vestigial and on it's a heterozygous if it's a heterozygous uh, state when parents will pass on these traits to the progeny uh, so these chromosomes when gamete formation takes place before meiosis these chromosomes undergo dna replication what we will have so single chromosome it starts looking like this so we have capital b because all the dna there is replicated uh, and we have these two sister chromatids this one and this one is sister chromatids of the same chromosome this chromosome will also replicate we have now uh, you know small b small b and um, vestigial recessively these homolog chromosomes okay uh, during meiosis they come closer to each other Okay. and we call this process as crossing over okay and during crossing over what happens the two uh, homologs two identical chromosomes they basically exchange let's say it's it was capital b and this is the capital b and this one is small b here we have uh, capital vg and here it's corresponding allele capital vg and on here we have small vg small vg and here we have small v so this crossing over results in exchange of the chromosomal segments physically chromosomes exchange segments from each other for example now this chromosome which was carrying both the wild type genes it will acquire due to this crossover which is going to happen like this it will acquire 
you know black allele and this which was with homozygous recessive alleles uh, will acquire wild type allele for that so the end result will be you have now capital b bg and then you have small b capital bg because the crossover was in the middle the other chromosome will look like we have small b and recessive vestigial but what we have acquired is capital b and vestigial now when they go through this crossing over so this structure this structure is called chiasmata chiasmata and after crossing over now they have these chromosomes after meiosis one which is also called a reductional division <clears throat> the two homologs that go to opposite poles and we will have two cells which will carry like sorry so this one is now capital b small bg small b small bg these two cells individually will undergo you know uh, second meiosis meiosis 2 which is now like a mitosis and the end result will be the sister chromatids will separate one of the cell will be this one another so this, the product of this one the other one will be carrying this one so this is one gamete as a result of meiosis this is one the products of this one will be one of the gamete will be capital b bg and the other cell will be small b vestigia so this is what we learned last time that when the two alleles are on the same chromosome and they pass on from parents to offsprings based on the distance distance between physical distance between the two genes they undergo recombination and that's why you don't i mean they, if they both are on the same chromosome theoretically according to mendel you were expecting this one but what you attained was these numbers, not 50% each. And these numbers were new combinations, which uh, Morgan's lab proved again that, you know, the number of recombinants is 17%. And this 17% actually represents the physical distance, physical distance between black and vestigial alleles bigger the distance remember bigger the distance between black and vestigial higher the number of recombinants 17 percent recombination 17 percent recombination means you had 100 meiotic events 100 meiosis and out of 100 17 short recombination clear is it clear so far and if we give you a problem in which you know we give you numbers let's say you got 944 965 206 i mean we give you phenotypes and genotypes and we ask you to calculate the recombinant frequency you can simply take the recombinants divided by total uh, that will be 0.17 or if you multiply this with 100 you will get recombination percentage but this is essentially showing you out of 100 meiotic events 17 showed these non-parental phenotypes these ones
And after Morgan's name, they call this physical distance like they said, black and vestigial are 17 centimorgans apart. Okay. So if an, uh, another gene, let's say vestigial and a uh, gene called, let's say, curly, are uh, 10 centimorgans apart. It means they are on the same chromosome and their distance is less as compared to distance between black and vestigia. Is it clear so far? Yes, sir. Good. So, What we are going to see now is the bigger question, which was about uh, which was about how do we prove that genes they reside on the same chromosome or how do we prove that genes indeed reside on chromosome so far we have developed an understanding uh, because we see law of independent assortment or recombination the big question morgan slab came across was how do we prove that genes they indeed reside on chromosome and there is some physical association between genes and chromosomes. Okay. What interestingly they found was they found a, a mutant uh, which was named white. So in order to answer this question, they had to discover and identify a chromosome that should carry an identifiable, a visual allele, which you can <clears throat> monitor through generations. What Morgan's lab discovered, interestingly, they discovered white mutant. White mutant means, so this is a normal wild type fly. Wild type fly means pure breeding, normal fly existing in a population naturally existing in a population they found a mutant which was named white okay look the phenotype its eyes eye color is white and the wild type has red eyes okay i mean this we don't need to go through this is typical fly life cycle so female after mating lays an egg uh, after 24 hours this egg uh, undergoes changes after a lot of cell division and we see first in star larvae after another 24 hours it enlarges a bit it is called second in star larvae we can see them in the food wilds and after another 24 hours we see a third in star larvae jo aap naked eye se bade aaram se dekh sakte ho jab aap when you eat gava, amrut, to jo sundi milti hai, wo, uh, ye third in star larva aapko milta hai. Then, after another two to three days, larva undergoes metamorphosis, it becomes immobile, uh, and that is the stage where it is under a case, uh, under a skeleton, and that stage is called pupa, where all the tissues in the larva undergo they are hydrolyzed and adult structures are formed. And by 10th day, you have an adult hatching out. So in 10 days, you can go from one generation to another generation. So what Mendel, uh, what Morgan did, his lab took this mutant and crossed this with uh, the normal red eyes. Normal red eyes means the wild type now females carrying normal red eyes were crossed to white eyed males 
So this was male. This sign is for male. This was female. What they discovered in F1, all flies, all flies had normal red eyes. But remember, they are F1. So what do you conclude from F1 phenotype about white? Hmm? Arfa, Arfa, what do you conclude about white phenotype by looking at F1, all normal red? Arfa, are you there? Please switch on your camera. Yes, sir. Uh, Ji, Roshin. What do you conclude about white phenotype by looking at F1 normal red eyes? Rasheen, are you there? Yes, sir. So? Um, sir, I think the white phenotype is recessive alien. Very good. Very good. So white is a recessive trait. Okay. That's what the conclusion is. Now, what they did, they took red-eyed females from F1. So the, in this population, they had males and females. What they did, they took red-eyed females, this is a sign for female, and crossed it with a normal male. Okay, now such kind of male. What they found, all the daughters were normal, but half of the males were normal and half of the males were white. A totally mind-blowing result, which doesn't fit anywhere. Let's say, if I write down here, normal red eyes, let's say we name it like this. Uh, let's write uh, capital W and capital W and white for small w, small w. Now, capital W means red eyes, okay? Here, what we will have all, well, red eyes, because this is dominant and this is recessive. Now you crossed this female, which was with a normal male, which means this, what do you expect? You expect, you know, So what will be phenotype of these four? Uh, Ahad, Ahad, would you like to tell us what should be phenotype of all these four flies here? Ahad, are you there? Ahad, are you there? So Zishan, what will be phenotype of these flies? Zishan Farid. Zishan also seems to be absent. So Nashra, Nashra, are you there? Um, yes, sir, um, it would be red. All will be red if we assume white is recessive, okay? But look at the phenotypes they are getting. They are getting out of this cross, which we tried to simplify it here. All females normal, half of the males normal, and half of the sons white. Very puzzling. What they did, they did another experiment. Let's have normal so it was male here. So what they said, they said we are going to get 
normal male but this time female should be white they crossed let's say white female with normal male right in the f1 what they find all males white and all females red right away there so this raised a question that you know it has something to do with the sex of the flies or my parents i used normal red eyed mother with white eyed father and all were red eyes but if i use red eyed sorry white mutant female and father is normal red i get all males white and all females red so they said you know it means this eye color trait has something to do with the sex of the flies it's sex linked okay whenever a scientist comes across such troubles the first thing he or she does it goes back to literature they try to read and find if somebody has you know slightest of clue from someone else results where i can think of an explanation what they found that way beyond their experiments in 1905 nettie and stevens they had discovered an odd pair of chromosomes and that odd pair of chromosomes today we know as sex chromosomes what nettie and stevens discovered that you know one member of this heteromorphic pair this odd pair appears identical in females one member let's say we have two chromosomes heteromorphic which means they look like this in females they look same but the other member which is this one it never appears in females it's only in the males so this is male and this is female which means so this member of this heteromorphic pair of chromosome which they named y chromosome it never appeared in the females this means now if you have 46 chromosomes in humans which we saw here i think here this one y means this is always male because it never appeared in the females and in females one of the heteromorphic uh, one of the uh, chromosome which appeared in the females it existed in pairs and that is this x okay so if we have 46 pairs of chromosomes in human cell and we go deep down there are 22 pairs which are identical homolog chromosomes and 23rd will be x y or x x if it is x x it's female if it is x y it's a male okay now they said could it be that in flies we have the white gene the gene which is responsible for red eyes when it is mutant it gives you white they said could it be this white gene is actually on the sex chromosomes so in the females for example they write x chromosome like this white on the x in 
in the males they write like this small w and y which never appeared in females y chromosome all flies will be normal because the gametes when you will have gametes from these flies females will always produce gametes which will be having x x w and definitely in addition to x they have other autosomes the other than sex chromosomes the chromosomes existing in cell they are called autosomes males after meiosis possibility is gametes will be two of from one cell four gametes so one of the cell will be like this and the other will be y so two will be y's and two gametes will be with x chromosome now when fertilization takes place you have capital w coming from this side fertilizing small this one since it's recessive it will be a red eye now this x or this x fertilizing gamete with y chromosome it becomes like this so what will be the sex of this fly versus this fly Who would like to answer G Ali, Ali Rahman, what will be the phenotype of this individual versus this individual? Are you there? Yes, sir. G Ali, Ali Rahman. Can you repeat? What will be gender of fly carrying this genotype versus fly carrying this genotype uh, so the left one uh, with both the capital x is female and the which is contain y is male very good so now what they said they said we took f1 red eyed female which means this one f1 red eyed female means capital w and small w a normal male will be this and this the gametes of these two will be x capital w x small w and this will be x capital w and y if you have checkerboard here let's write down like this x capital w this can meet x small w this can meet x capital w this can meet and y now after fertilization we have x capital w x capital w x capital w x small w x capital w y and x small w y geospa um sir why is the second gamete male is no chromosome is no chromosome x and y right the 50 50 percentage mein no why is it a male which one are uh, the second one jo ali ne bataya hai the one with x and y these are not gametes these are individuals but uh, after fertilization this 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 or this all right clear now we have four individuals as a result of you know or possibilities which ones are daughters uswa can you tell us um first one second one daughters so, and third and fourth sorry first one and second one are daughters yes both have with x yes. chromosomes and both are normal because they carry capital w allele at least at least one capital w allele which is dominant so red eyes and here 
half of the suns. So this will be X capital W Y and second will be X small W Y. Now this is acting as a recessive because the homolog is absent. And this is since W capital, this will be normal with red eyes. This will be with white eyes. So this was the discovery of sex linked inheritance or sex chromosomes. What Morgan's lab concluded or hypothesized after the experiments that X and Y are sex chromosomes and they somehow are involved in determination of the sex of the fly. And gene or gene for eye color is on the X chromosome and Y does not contain any eye color gene. This was their conclusion and that what explained uh, you know half sun normal half sun white okay uh, i explained you uh, this in a uh, in a previous slide now why do we call them sex chromosome chromosomes other than x and y are called autosomes okay uh, they don't play a role in the determination of sex x and y specifically are called sex chromosomes because genes residing on the x and y they are responsible for determination of gender in flies now if you pay attention here in prosophila melanogaster or humans both if you have two x chromosomes both organisms will develop as females now, these two X chromosomes are besides 22 pairs of autosomes. Chromosome 1 to 22 exist in pairs. But if the 23rd pair is two X chromosomes, then we develop as female. But if the 23rd pair is one X and one Y, we develop as males. An interesting situation arises and where we see species specific difference. So if we have two X and a Y in flies, it is going to develop as female and in humans, it is going to develop as male. And if we have X naught, which means absence of Y chromosome in flies, they develop as males and in humans, they develop as female why there are such differences i explain you so in humans for example so this is how the structure of x and y chromosome look like so this is the x chromosome much bigger and this is y chromosome the region from this all the way up to this this is totally different and this region on the top red or the bottom this one this is called pseudo autosomal region now there is a gene called sry gene which is highlighted here as a green line that resides on the y chromosome in humans and that gene is responsible for maleness that's why when you have one y chromosome present despite presence of two x chromosomes x x y develops as a male in humans and absence of y develops as a female in humans in the presence of single x but in flies it's very interesting in flies what we have there is x to autosome ratio. Flies have four chromosomes. Semicolon means independent chromosome. Fourth chromosome in flies is not written because it's totally jumbled up. It's, it's considered to be full of transposons and junk DNA. So we don't write them on, on the, on the, um, 
papers normally. Uh, what they say that there are two autosomes, although chromosome four is also an autosome, but it's not considered in fly genetics. It's considered as a as a useless chromosome. Okay, useless because you know it's heterochromatic, genes are off, and it's full of transposons. Now they say if we consider two autosomes, two X, if the ratio of X to autosomes is so 2x over two autosomes one it's going to be a female and if x to autosome ratio is so 1x over 2 is 0.5 it will develop as a male but if we go deep down in DNA sequencing and, and the genes residing on X and Y chromosome, what we discovered in last 20 years that actually sex determination genes are actually residing on X chromosomes in fly. Okay. So that's why when you have XXY, XXY means 2X over two autosomes ratio is one you will develop as a female and x naught you develop as a male because ratio of x to autosome is one over two oh point five clear so we finish up to here with uh, this genetics and we take five minutes break and we continue with our lecture on developmental genetics uh, abdullah will uh, share with you i have uploaded another uh, slide which is about the incomplete dominance uh, but let's don't touch this trait but what i want you to uh, do uh, exercise on genetic map to determine physical distance so this go back and read about this genetic map okay uh, there's yellow body color gene uh, in uh, sorry you can see you have yellow white vermilion miniature these are four different genes uh, you are given a recombination percentages or let's say you are given a b and c three different genes and you are given a cross between homozygous a a b b uh, with homozygous a a uh, b sorry a a b b recessive and these are the so the biggest numbers are always parental i told you and small numbers are 50 50 are the non-parentals and you should calculate the uh, frequency of the combination or uh, forget about this one you don't need this one okay so let's take five minutes break and uh, let's meet uh, at 4 25 on my computer it's 4 18 uh, it will be seven minutes break and we will continue with uh, lecture on development okay so let's take a break now yes, there are two questions by two students g you can ask questions go on who has a question ali rahman and utwa uh, thank you sir sir following the uh, punit scare agar hum dekhe to sir kya will there be always a fixed ratio between male and female gender uh, in the flies x to autosome ratio yes if it's a normal female do x chromosome hoge to ratio 1 hogi aur female mein agar uh, male mein x y hai to 0.5 ratio oh, okay thank you sir ji who else had question um sir what chromosomes do we have in our what chromosomes please repeat your question Who was asking this question? Please repeat it. Sir, Usma was asking. I think there's a connectivity issue. We lost her voice. Um, so, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I was asking, what chromosomes do we have in third gender? 
In this video then, we'll look at the beginning of development, looking into the ovary at an unfertilized egg. It then gets fertilized by sperm, which travel down the fallopian tube. So here, millions of sperm coming along. Several of them will hit the egg and try to penetrate it, but one will win, as it were, go into the nucleus, and then there's a reprogramming process where the male and female nuclei have their genes uh, set aside to be turned on and off for early development. Here you see early cleavage stages occurring, and this is one of the early growth phases. As the embryo moves down the fallopian tube, it's going to form an important stage called the blastocyst here in a few seconds. Of course, in real life, that takes days, about five days. At this stage, then, I'd like to draw your attention to the inside of the blastocyst, where there are cells called the inner cell mass, which I'll be abbreviating as ICM. Those are the cells that make the entire animal. And the outer cells give rise to the placenta and other supporting tissues. At this stage, the embryo implants into the wall of the uterus. This is when a pregnancy is really initiated. And now we'll see those blue inner cell mass cells form a disc. And then as the cells continue to grow, they change their physical positions, their kind of geographical relationship to one another. And you'll see that represented here as this disc gets transformed into an embryo. Those lines represent sites where cells are migrating in and out. And here's an important stage when the three beginning layers of the embryo, the so-called germ layers, are formed. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. As development proceeds, there's more growth and movement of cells. It'll begin to form a neural tube. Here it turns and appendages start to bud out. You see the head forming and the eye. And then eventually we get a small embryo. And some months later, of course, this would be born as a young baby. So can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So this short video has basically summarized. In this video, then, we'll look at the beginning of development looking into the ovary at an This video has summarized uh, the entire development process. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So this video is summarizing from the point of fertilization to organogenesis. Organogenesis means where you see organs developing. But the whole process of development, which is extremely crucial uh, for the normal development of a living organism, is immediately after fertilization, then this stage which, which is going on now, if you look at the video, the early cell divisions, very rapid, fast cell divisions, which we call the cleavage cell divisions, and eventually embryo becomes a small ball of cells with a cavity, uh, a fluid-filled cavity, which is called the blastocyst stage. So this is, now it is showing a blastocyst stage where you have a fluid-filled cavity, and inside this cavity, you have cells organized in a disc-shaped uh, manner. Uh, all the cells which contribute to our body, uh, which uh, he referred to as inner cell mass, ICM. Uh, these cells are the ones, these blue ones, which are becoming a disc shape. They are the ones which are going to contribute to all our body cells. The rest of the cells surrounding ones are called trophectoderm stem cells, and they attach us in the form of placenta to our mothers. This, these changes are happening here. What, what is here, we, we are watching actually changes, large scale movements in the cells, uh, in, the, in those inner cell mass, uh, disc shaped cells, 
uh, and these cells become endoderm, mesoderm, uh, ectoderm. This is the three earliest distinction of three different kinds of population of cells. And then now the uh, neurulation, this is the neurulation where brain, earliest brain is being formed uh, followed by organogenesis where you see different organs uh, developing. So we are going to uh, learn how uh, all this happens because uh, important point to understand or important point to learn is that we start, our development starts from a single cell. Uh, why I cannot uh, see the, okay, let's go there. And let's open the development lecture. Do you see my slides? No, sir. Do you see my slides? No, sir, we cannot. Oh, where is the... Okay. Now, do you see my slides? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. The important point to understand and learn is that we start our development, our life from a single cell, which results from the process called fertilization, where sperm, it fuses with egg cells. So this is an oocyte, which is attacked by thousands and thousands of sperms and only one of the sperm becomes successful. From here, we start our life. And then this is the big day of our life when we start journey uh, of our development. This cell divides into two. So let's say we were a single fertilized egg. Uh, 23 chromosomes came from my mother, 23 chromosomes from my father and this single cell was the first day of my life. This cell divides into two cells through mitosis. These two go into four. These four go into, you know, eight cells and so on. And by 28 day, we see, you know, these earliest signs of neurulation and and the organogenesis where different organs are developing. However, these first 28 days, that real development is taking place in first three weeks or so. After 28 days, we see, you know, embryos, fetus is developing. You see organs, uh, you know, all this is growing up. This is the period of growth. And eventually we have, you know, by 40th week, we uh, come into this the real world. In order to study this process, uh, because it's very important to learn the intricacies involved in this, the fundamentals and the molecules of this process, because anything which goes wrong in this process that has severe uh, complications or, or consequences in the form of death in worst case, or, you know, some uh, sphere phenotypes, you know, deformities, morphological and, and deformities in our, in our body. In order to understand this process, scientists, and they used, you know, xenopus, um, they have used uh, chicken, uh, hen, they have used the fruit fly, C. elegans, you know, mouse itself. Nowadays, since last 20 years, zebra fish, and even you will be surprised at plants. Okay. Now, early on, Xenopus, uh, studies in Xenopus, they shed uh, a lot of light on, on, uh, on our understanding about this developmental processes. For example, uh, sperm and oocyte uh, fuses, and this is the fertilized egg. This fertilized egg undergoes cell division. Now it becomes two cells, uh, then repeated cell divisions, eventually it arrives at the stage of blast food. These early cell division 
very fast cell divisions where cell size does not increase it's just nuclear cell division you know cell does not have intervening phase of growth cell just replicates its dna divides into two replicates its dna repli and divides into two these cell divisions are called cleavage cell division or cleavage they uh, eventually embryo uh, becomes you know uh, ball of cells where we have this inner cell mass and these trophectoderm stem cell, uh, trophectoderm cells, this stage is called blastula, and this fluid filled cavity is called blastocyst. Uh, uh, sorry, blastocy, C O E L. After um, uh, blastula stage of development, uh, suddenly cells, they, you know, uh, so by this stage, embryo is two dimensional structure. Here, the cells in the inner cell mass, these cells, you know, uh, these disc shaped cells, they start moving. You know, the outer cells, they start invaginating, they start moving inwards. And the embryo attain a three dimensional structure where you at the end have ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And th th this stage, when we have uh, cell movements uh, within the embryo, we call this stage gastrulation and the end of gastrulation we see three distinct cell types or population of cells within the embryo and then uh, this is called the primitive streak where you know cells are uh, moving inwards and this is the beginning of uh, neurulation where earliest brain is being formed Overall, this stage is called organogenesis, and we see, you know, by the end of this stage, we see, you know, um, uh, neural development. The, the spine is there, eyes are appearing, heart is there, etc. Uh, then eventually, Xenopus undergoes uh, metamorphosis. It looks like tadpole. It looks like a fish. You know, it has a long tail, and this metamorphosis eventually leads to sexually mature adult uh, frog which can live within water and on on uh, you know on on land as well tadpole uh, develops within the water so the basic life cycle in uh, vertebrates vertebrates are the organisms which have uh, a spine uh, so that consists of you know after fertilization, it has cleavage divisions, gastrulation, uh, then germ layer formation. These three, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, collectively they are called germ layers. Remember, they are different germ layers, not germ cells. Germ cells means sperm and oocyte. Okay. And these three germ layers, uh, three different layers of cells or uh, populate uh, three different kinds of cells mesoderm for example contributes to muscle cartilage bone heart blood and kidney uh, endodermal uh, cells uh, contribute to gut lungs and liver and ectoderm it contributes to ep epidermis nervous uh, nervous system etc uh, then uh, after germ layers after gastrulation we saw organogenesis takes place um, different organs, cells, these cells, they uh, group together in different tissues and eventually organs uh, become visible and metamorphosis in uh, Xenopus takes place. And finally, we end our lives with death. Okay. In plants also, I mean, this is the animal development. Yeah. In plants, uh, development is slightly different in case of animals we have early on distinction between uh, somatic cells and germline cells the uh, cells which are going to undergo meiosis early on there's such distinction but in plants all the development is somatic all tissues are somatic so if this is fertilized egg you have two cells and the basal cell is going to develop as you know future root cells or contribute to future root cells the terminal cell it divides you know into eight cells then 16 cells and you have you know this heart-shaped uh, stage 
of development. All this is happening. This development is happening after fertilization within the ovary in plants. And you know, you have two uh, cotyledonary leaves, two seed leaves, we call them, which are within the seed. Okay. Uh, and we have these suspensor cells, uh, eventually uh, embryo. So the, within the seed, this embryo is connected. When you sow the seed, this seed emerges out. You have the two cotyledonary leaves initially, and then you know a lot of cell division takes place. You see these leaves, and depending on environment and stage of the stage of the plants, uh, same somatic cell may uh, develop into flower, uh, which is a diploid structure. And on this flower, then we have you know uh, meiosis going on. Uh, in the ovaries and ovules. We'll focus in this uh, lecture and this course, development of vertebrates and invertebrates. So what you should know that uh, in these process, these uh, stages of development, you know, what we said, cleavage, gastrulation, germline, all this is happening organogenesis within first 21 days so you know if we have to understand development or learn development we have to understand the concepts uh, cell division you know all cell division is followed by pattern formation and then morphogenesis where embryo actually attains three-dimensional structure and uh, uh, very well organized uh, uh, cellular structure is laid down eventually differentiation this is the stage where different cells within the embryo let's say uh, we have ectoderm mesoderm endoderm after gastrulation what is happening different cells they start you know uh, grouping together already at the pattern formation and morphogenesis these cells they start committing to commitment of cells to specific fate. For example, these cells are going to make future eyes, these cells are going to make future uh, heart, and these ones liver, kidney, etc. All these cells physically, they look same. There's no distinction in their morphology. But deep down in their nucleus and in their biochemical environment, in their proteins, their genes, the kinds of genes which are being expressed, they are different. This is onset of commitment to a specific cell, fate, a cell lineage, their identity is being established. Before cells arrive there, you know, it goes through after cell division, cells are organized all the cells in an embryo, they are organized in a very, very characteristic, specific pattern. For example, if you pay attention, cells in my limbs, in my, in, in my arms, and cells in my leg, if you look at their structure, they look more or less same. I have, you know, digits, I have elbow, I have uh, shoulder, and similarly, you have uh, you know, thighs and, and uh, knees and, and you have toes at the end. Cell types, they are organized in a, and then these cell types are different. So the pattern they are laid down in arm or in legs or in, in, in my lungs, etc. They are very different and all this is happening very, very early during eye development. When there is even no sign of any organ or tissue, so after fertilization, first thing embryo does is it undergoes repeated mitotic cell divisions. And these early cell divisions are called cleavage. This process or this stage of development is called cleavage cell divisions. What happens that the fertilized egg, it divides repeatedly uh, and the resultant cells are, become smaller and smaller. There's no increase in overall cell mass. If this was the fertilized egg, the overall size will remain same. It will be two. Overall size will remain same. Cells will become four and then eight and then 16. 
So these are very specialized cell divisions uh, in which only DNA replication is taking place, followed by mitosis. There's no phase of growth. Normally, whenever a cell divides, before it enters into cell division or DNA replication, it grows a bit, it attains certain size, and then it decides, okay, I'm entering the cell cycle. But in cleavage, nothing such things happen. It's just DNA replication mitosis, DNA replication mitosis, and we have uh, you know, uh, embryo uh, becomes, let's say, 16, 32 cell stage. Now, what actually determines uh, and how early cell division takes place? Because it matters how, uh, you know, if embryo is going to divide in this plane, plane of division, or this, or this, etc. All this is predetermined. Uh, for example, this is Xenopus. Xenopus egg is divided into two poles. Uh, the upper pole, this one, is called animal pole, and the lower pole, which is filled with yolk, is called vegetal pole. Okay. Now, sperm uh, enters and it fertilizes the oocyte, which is lying here. The one end chromosomes come from there, one end there, and now the fertilized egg becomes a diploid cell. This diploid cell uh, rotates, the cytoplasm of this embryo rotates, it, so it's shown here. So animal pole, vegetal pole, and you can see if this was the equator, equator it's now the animal pole has undergone uh, a rotation and you see here this region which is represented with a bracket this is called gray crescent this gray crescent is created due to this rotation and now cell is you know going to divide into two cells which is basically the nucleus here is, is it's it's one big cell still with you know the uh, mitosis being initiated here. But when it will divide, it will divide into two cells like this. Since there is yolk here, you know, the plane of division, it takes time before, uh, and it slows down the cell division. But remember, I want you to remember this gray crescent area. This is very important point in the uh, stages of development in uh, Xenopus. Now, what happens uh, as soon as the fertilization takes place, uh, these blue uh, circles uh, are basically uh, a protein which is called, uh, a kinase called GSK3, uh, and this GSK3 uh, is part of cellular machinery. The, this protein is already there in the oocyte, okay? Uh, and it targets GSK3 actually is a kinase. Its function uh, activation leads to degradation of all this uh, what color you call this orange color or whatever is this, this is a protein called beta-catenin in the wind pathway, wingless pathway, developmental pathway. As soon as fertilization takes place, the rotation of animal fold is followed. You can see now, this is this place which we call the gray crescent area. This is where the initial vegetal pole uh, and at the base of the vegetal pole there is a protein which actually inhibits the gsk3 okay it stops gsk3 to become activate as soon as it moves this protein after rotation of the animal pole now all these blue dots 
which are basically the GSK3, the one which are in the vicinity of this protein, they will be blocked. They will be inhibiting blue circles, the GSK3 to become active, okay, which is shown here. And beta catenin will not be degraded in this part where GSK3 is inactive. However, where action of this protein cannot go, GSK3 will become active and degrade all the beta catenin. Now you can see beta catenin is degraded and only beta catenin is present in this. Now what happens, already you can see the cytoplasm of this cell is having two different regions. One full of beta catenin, the other lacking beta catenin. When this cell will divide into two, it will be, the cytoplasm will be unequally distributed. It will not be equal distribution. The two resultant cells, one will be with a lot of beta catenin and the other one will be lacking beta catenin. Already nature has designed and engineered a principle that it has created difference in two different cells. And that may explain you all the differences you see in your body you have. You know, you start your life from single cell, both the cells, uh, both sperm and oocyte, their fusion leads to 46 chromosomes in human fertilized egg. And then, you know, each subsequent cell has 46 chromosomes. When the genetic material is same in all the cells, how do they then lead to differentiation or to different cell types like, you know, eye cells, uh, liver, uh, blood cells. Within blood, you have, you know, uh, red blood cells, you have uh, white blood cells, and so on. There's more than 200 different cell types in our body. This distinction or this diversity is result of, of course, differential gene expression, which is topic of our uh, lecture tomorrow. But in this context, you see already the cell, single cell, when it is dividing into two, the two resultant cells are different from each other. And if you have beta catenin, and uh, if you have a lot of beta catenin and you don't have beta catenin, the one which lag and the one which has beta catenin, they are going to express different genes in future. Okay, that's how development lays down the foundation. The amount of yolk, remember, I told you, it influences how the cleavage divisions takes place. For example, this is C. urchin egg. Yolk is uniformly distributed. And you can see after fertilization, it divides into two, two into four, four into eight, and then development moves on. However, in frog, in Xenopus, uh, where you have all the yolk is deposited in the <clears throat> vegetal pole, the initial cell division will take this very rapidly here and then <clears throat> it cannot pass through <clears throat> so quickly the yolk. Uh, then again the cell division will take place, two cells will go and become four and after four the plane of cell division changes, the upper cells divide more rapidly as compared to these cells. Okay. Uh, all the uh, development in case of, for example, another another example of yolk filled egg uh, is uh, chick in hen. Uh, it contains, you know, so thick yolk in the center. Uh, all the development in chicks, it takes place at the dorsal side. Not, it does not involve cleavage of the yolk, but, you know, just on the top of the yolk, all the development is taking place. You know, you can see the planes of cell division taking place. Then this is like uh, embryo is developing on top of the yolk and you can see cleavage divisions are incomplete due to hindrance created by the 
uh, yolk. In case of fruit flies, development is even more in interesting. What happens after fertilization? Uh, one cell uh, is this one, which is basically the oocyte. Sperm entered, it fertilized the egg. This uh, nucleus is going to divide into two. These, and, and the, I'm saying nucleus, not the cell. Cell remains same, one big cytoplasm like this one. Within the cytoplasm, nuclear divisions take place. And these are synchronous. These synchronous cell divisions means all these nuclei, they replicate, divide, replicate, divide at the same time. And there comes a stage where you have single cytoplasm, one plasma membrane, containing so many different nuclei, all at the same stage. And we call such stage in fruit fly syncytium. Syncytium or syncytial blastoderm. Voyage of blasto stage the blastula stage the. And then comes a stage in fruit flies that all these cells, all these nuclei, they move to periphery. All these ones which are here, they come on periphery and they get themselves organized in a specific pattern and they become individual cells by having individual cell membranes. And this stage is called cellular blastoderm, or you can also call it cellularization because they become individual cells by having their membrane. Now, the planes of cell divisions are very important uh, during early development. For example, here at the cleavage uh, in mammals is unique. The first cleavage is, you know, uh, in this direction, then second is perpendicular. And what is most important that Since we learned that the cells become smaller and smaller, and there's no increase in overall size of the embryo. This is attained by, you know, the plane of the cell division. The first plane of cell division is parallel to, let's say this is the animal pole. This is the vegetal pole in oocyte. The first plane, of cell division is parallel to this axis. And second is then perpendicular to this axis. And then again, maybe like this, because it has to keep all those cells within the same space in a very specific or specialized pattern. In the case of, uh, Humans, uh, if we pay attention here, you can see eight cell stage. So embryo from one, it became two, two became four, and four, they became eight cells. Okay. These eight cells is the very important stage where cells become compressed. They are becoming, they are being, undergoing a compaction. Their outer side looks, you know, flat. I don't have, I think the cartoon here, but inside they are attached to each other like this. Can't draw. Uh, in a, if I try to draw three dimensional <laughs> structure, so outside still looks round and you have, due to compaction inside, they are flattened a bit. These eight cells undergo 16 stages. And at this stage, you can clearly see the inner cell mass, which is here. And these cells, when you are 32 cell stage, you very clearly see that disc shape, which was called ICM fluid-filled cavity, 
and these cells are called trophoblasts which do not co contribute to our body they contribute to placental development and all our body develops some inner cell mass now all this is taking place when uh, cell becomes blastocyst or uh, a blastola it it gets implanted okay it uh, the trophoblast cells they adhere to the uterine wall in within the cells in the uterus of female uh, which is also called the endometrium this is the stage of implantation embryo is being implanted in the physically implanted uh, in in the uterus uh, uterine wall and you can see these trophoblast cells are physically uh, entering into the uterus wall and embryo becomes attached and this is where our development will take place in a cell mass will keep dividing and in our loving mother's wombs we we develop uh, now how much time i have abdullah Uh, sir we have 20 minutes okay yeah we can finish easily now after blastula uh, you remember i said you have to remember the gray crescent this gray crescent uh, is the site where after blastula stage the major cell movement starts what happens cells at this particular place they undergo change in their shape and they become kind of bottle uh, shaped cells uh, before they move already uh, we have you know uh, we have three very clearly distinct cell types or populations of cells here yellow ones are representing endoderm blue ones ectoderm and red ones are mesoderm they are different and these cells i told you why they are different because they are going to contribute to development of different kinds of cells tissues and organs already their fates are determined okay now what happens that a higher order commitment is taken place that okay these cells are going to be ectodermal and they will the ectodermal cells can contribute to development of only a certain kind of cell types these are mesodermal which can only contribute to development of certain kind of cell types and then of course the endoderm now uh, what happens that the, at this particular stage just before gastrulation these cells they undergo change in cell shape they become bottle shape and the ectodermal cells they start moving inward an embryo from two dimensional structure moves into three dimensional structure that is the beginning of gastrulation uh, i'll explain you mosaic development and regulative development uh, before we uh, talk about uh, gastrulation and the subsequent developmental stages there are two kinds of developmental systems or, or types one is uh you know regulative development regulative development uh, is a kind of development in certain species which is not affected by loss of some cells or 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 few cells in early development during cleavage for example there is one embryo which divides into two if you kill this cell okay the other cell it's regulated in such a manner that it can develop into a normal not 100% same but still a rudimentary embryo so we call this regulative because you know even after death of one or two cells at early developmental stage the other one compensated and that was uh, referred to as regulative cell development regulative development the other one other developmental pattern is called mosaic in case of mosaic uh, it means you know a cell it contains certain uh, ingredients let's call them uh, 
this was a concept 100 years ago or 200 years ago and if each component let's say a b c d e f you know each of these components they have very crucial role if one is missing you know it will it may result in death of uh, an embryo which means here something was indispensable in one species for example these experiments were done in sea urchin i, I believe but in another species if you do similar kind of experiment you know embryo does not develop it dies it means that ingredients early on which were lost they could not be compensated by b c d etc and that kind of development is called mosaic development now in sea urchin uh, if we see blastula or blastocyst development uh, so blastula is this is the blastocyst in uh, sea urchin you see the ectodermal cells they start moving inwards and these cells the one at the bottom these are basically the mesoderm future mesodermal cell the ectodermal cells they invaginate and the cells <clears throat> they detach from ectoderm they come inwards and then they undergo change in their shape on one side they become very very fine extensions of cellular membranes we call such structures philopodia and on the other side they have these uh, still uh, globular oval shaped cells and they drag just like the web or the the, the string of spider man agar aapne dekha hai spider ki jo wo string hai so this is pulling actually this ectodermal cell inwards and all these are part of the gastrulation movements in the end of gastrulation what you have you know a complete gut is formed and the end of uh, gastrulation leads to you know in case of urchin, you have on one side you have the mouth and the other side you have the anus this is how uh, urchin development takes place in case of xenopus um, what happens at the i told you near the gray crescent area uh, these cells undergo change in cell shape mesodermal cells they start moving inwards it's shown here uh, these cells they start moving inwards the whole embryo undergoes rotation okay uh, you can see now the mesodermal cells which were here they are now lying here and the end result of gastrulation is you have very three clearly uh, distinct population of cells ectodermal mesoderm and endoderm in the middle and you have the earliest intestine kind of a gut kind of thing which is called archenetron is established and then you know ectodermal cells they contribute to development of skin and different organs which it can synthesize mesoderm contribute to development of different kinds of cell types and uh, so with the endoderm uh why gray crescent is important gray crescent is very important uh, because you know cells in gray crescent just this region uh, contain few cells and if you can isolate and transplant these cells somewhere else these cells can contribute to development of a whole new embryo okay so there is something special in this region this experiment was done by Hans Spiemann and uh, the question he asked are the nuclear blastomere uh, you know they are totipotent uh, or they, are, they can lead to totipotency is a concept in development that one cell can lead to development of complete normal individual in plants it's very common you take leaf disc you take you know cuttings they are totally important a whole organism is formed in humans for example egg and oocyte they are totally important okay now the question was what hans beeman did he tied the oocyte egg with a thin uh, hair uh, and embryo the this 
oocyte was now divided into two. Now, what he discovered that both the cells, which he tied with the uh, hair and divided them into two, each cell divided into a normal embryo. But if the division of embryo excluded the gray crescent, which means one of the embryo in ha has the gray crescent, the other does not, what he finds that only the one which, which had the gray crescent, it, it developed into embryo, the other one did not, okay? It means this, so this is mosaic development or regulative development. हाँ जी ये रेगुलेटिव है या मोजेक है दिस इज मोजेक बिकॉज यू यू नो यू एक्सक्लूडेड सम कॉम्पोनेंट एंड द अदर वन डिड नॉट डेवलप एट ऑल इफ द अदर वन डेवलप नॉर्मली देन यू वुड हैव सेड इट्स रेगुलेटिव बिकॉज इट कैन कॉम्पनसेट फॉर लॉस ऑफ वॉट एवर इज प्रेजेंट इन द ग्रे क्रिएट सो हांच पीमन said that you know there is something special in the gray crescent uh, either the cells there are uh, totally important but not every cell uh, uh, in in this embryo it means is totally important but only in this region cells are totally important hans peman did uh, together with hilde mangold uh, few other very interesting experiments Uh, although they had no idea about dna proteins etc but simply you know cut and paste kind of experiments what they did they uh, determined they knew the uh, presumptive cell fate for example this is the presumptive notochord or the region where uh, spine is formed uh, presumptive endoderm dorsal blast uh, dorsal lip of blastopore dorsal lip of blastopore is actually this is the region you know where gray crescent is and where cells undergo change this is called dorsal lip of blastopore uh, so what hanch peman did um, you know he did early versus late stage uh, transplantation experiments what he did he took for example he transplanted the early glasto uh, early stage gastrula early stage gastrula means Uh, where just cells are uh, realigning and they are about to move now what they did they took uh, blastopore lip dorsal lip of blastopore from early stage gastrula uh, from let's say this embryo and transplanted it into a different embryo what they discovered that if we transplant at early take dorsal lip of blastopore cut it transplant it at another embryo which is also at early stage so we can see development of two embryos a secondary embryo develops with, due to a dorsal lip of blastopore or this gray crescent area we transplant However, this is uh, though this is concluding that the dorsal lip of the blastopore is critical site for cell determination, a cell fate determination. Uh, it Hans Peman also called it organizer. It is organizer because because in normal embryo, it is organizing the development of normal embryo, all the cells. However. it changes if we take let's say late stage very late stage and then transplant we may not see this develop but at early stage when cells are still yet to they are uh, yet to commit to specific lineage when you transplant them into a different uh, place in a growing embryo they will develop into a, a normal uh, embryo as well so with this uh, we uh we have still 5 more minutes uh what is actually happening and this is the i said what is the 
it is important to learn what is the um, mechanism or the molecules behind the uh, organizer region or dorsal lip of the blastopore. Now you remember we had beta catenin, we had uh, GSK, okay, uh, and you remember we had the gray crescent established where we had uh, high beta catenin, high activation of beta catenin, GSK was inactive in the region which do not show organizer behavior is the one which lacked beta catenin. Now beta catenin is a transcription factor. It shuttles into nucleus and it activates specific genes. So beta catenin in the vegetal cells uh, is necessary for the formation of the organizer. We I just showed you on the previous slide. And experiments where you deplete uh, beta catenin or ectopic, ectopic means if beta catenin is normally active only in this region, if using genetic tricks or biochemical tricks, if you activated beta catenin here as well, you rescued it from either degradation or you switched on its gene uh, ectopically away from the ectopic means away from natural location where it is normally expressed. Uh, at the time of gastrulation, you can see, uh, you know, uh, that that region, uh, the protein beta catenin, it will activate cell signaling cascade that then induces primary embryonic organizer and sets up the anterior posterior body axis. Anterior posterior kya hota hai? Ye hamara anterior side hai and tail is the posterior side. Okay. So what beta catenin does? in regions where you don't have beta catenin normally in embryo. So no beta catenin is there. TCF3 protein uh, is bound and uh, genes are repressed. However, in this region where beta, a lot of beta catenin is present, it goes to the nucleus. It binds to this TCF3 uh, protein and it results in activation of uh, Sarmas protein, which was repressed in this region, okay? And Sarmas then goes, binds its uh, transcription factor. It goes and it activates another gene called goose coal gene. Uh, and that protein is formed, which goes and activates the, or behaves as organizer region. This whole, That's why this whole region is, behave because totally different cascade of genes are active here. So we stop here. Uh, next week and uh, next lecture tomorrow when we meet, we'll talk about, you know, this is basically neurulation. In the video, if you remember video, this cell movement was taking place, primitive streak, etc. Uh, let's don't go into detail. Uh, so basically neurulation leads to development of early spine and the and the and the brain and when these cells are moving inwards uh, we call this primitive streak uh, in that video also he showed that you know embryo in the disc on one side it starts developing and then it extends to uh, the posterior side so that is basically on this side our head is going to be and this is our tail or uh, toe side, okay? So, uh, while this process is taking place, you know, uh, a lot of cells detach. These cells are very important. We call them neural crest cells. They contribute to a lot of different tissues and organs in our body. But what is important is when all this is happening, we just saw a glimpse, one transcription factor creating distinction between two different regions or two different kinds of cell types, how actually different cell types are established and how we become, you know, eyes and, you know, uh, liver, kidney, blood, epithelial cells and et cetera. Tomorrow we are going to learn about the genes. We are going to learn about differential gene expression. 
differential gene expression. We are going to learn if beta catenin has initiated, you know, unequal distrib due to unequal distribution of cytoplasm. If beta catenin has activated certain gene, what role these genes are going to play in subsequent development, which result in 200 different cell types in our body? Okay. So, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, do you have any questions? 